So Patrick Joyce is in Padua uh, for a seminar on cultural history, and so we'd like to uh, profit of this occasion for an interview. Uh, an interview that will be about his scientific trajectory from the first uh, work during the 70s to today and the new book uh, uh, he is uh, writing. Uh, you are an expert also of uh, social narrative, so it's uh, interesting to ask you to make your own narrative. Uh, I think we have to start with your formation uh, years uh, and with the decision to take the road of the uh, historical writing and the influence played uh, on it, the different uh, influence. Uh, you wrote that uh, the writing of history became a means of self-definition for you. Uh, which is, uh, in which sense, uh, and uh, if you can uh, explain us this uh, year, formation years. <laughs> well, it's always difficult for uh, um, somebody looking back in their life to um, have an accurate sense of what was happening at the time, because so much life has intervened, obviously. Also because as an historian, one knows that one is formed by forces and changes that uh, one isn't aware of so often. So in talking about uh, my own formation, or about, uh, in trying to think about a narrative of my, my formation, of my life, I'm very conscious of the selectivity going on. But having said that, um, it's, uh, I was drawn to history, I think partly because of my background, my background was I was born in London in 1945, just after the end of the war. And I grew up in a Britain which was um, profoundly influenced by, by class, and I think was in the process of coming out of the, the almost century-long um, ancien regime of class, um, which changed in the 60s, although by no means completely. So I was born into an Irish Catholic working class environment in West London, um, almost more Irish than the Irish, uh, as they often regarded. And I was aware of a, a double kind of dislocation from what was around me. So, in that we were Irish Catholic and therefore separate, and I was also, from the age of about 15 or 16, became aware of, of the social geography of London, and that geography told me things about class that I hadn't realized. Of course, when you grow up as a child, as a young person, you live in the same environment, you don't see the differences. But London is a kind of um, a map of inequality. A great city, a wonderful city, um, and a city I love uh, more than any. But uh, it's the, it's been a kind, it has been, and still is, a teacher to me in terms of the successive waves of immigrants that moved through the city. So my formation, I think, was one in which I was sensitized to, uh, to differences. I was aware of the community around me, the British working class community, um, as something different. I had a sense of differences, I think, of being to some extent dislocated from what was around me, but also part of both worlds at the same time. It's a complex um, aspect. Um, and I think this kind of drove me into um, a sense of um, being interested at a distance in looking at what was around me. And I came um, to understand the nature of class distinctions in a particular kind of way, which was not available to, I think, many historians uh, uh, who were not born into the context I was. Most British historians, most, I suppose most historians in, in, um, in developed academic um, nations, as it were, um, they don't come from this kind of environment. So I was a child of the kind of social changes that went on in the 1960s, in which, for the first time, children from my generation were going to university. And there are a number of us of my generation, Carolyn Steedman is another historian of the same generation, who for the first time were catapulted into uh, this new kind of world. As I say, a world I was also learning about growing up as an adolescent and child. In London. So uh, I think some of the initial imp uh, forces that impelled me towards um, 
thinking socially, as it were, but also thinking historically, because I was very conscious of the past of my own parents. Um, and I became conscious of two things, of that difference, of the past, or three things. I up as a, as a historian in Britain during the 70s, and when we think to, to this period, and to this context, uh, we think to a very lively context, uh, uh, a sort of laboratory of new historical imagination mm -hmm. uh, around the social history overall, uh, first of all. Uh, and so I'd like to ask you, how did you uh, experience this, uh, uh, this context? Uh, I, I think you were in Oxford, if I remember mm -hmm. well. Um, well, I think the 60s actually, in Britain anyway, and perhaps more widely, really were well, between 1965 and 75. Mm -hmm. um, that was when one had a full sense of the change, and it was after 75 that things started to move apart, I think, and partly to the Vietnam War. Um, I experienced it, I think, um, let me say, my first university, I should mention. Uh, well, I went to work, I left school. Um, at the age of 16, and I went to work in a variety of jobs. And then people like in my formation had no idea about university. So almost accidentally, I discovered university, and I thought, well, I'll go there, it sounds a good idea, it's better than working. <laughs> so um, I went to Kiel. Now, Kiel was an interesting place because it was, um, uh, it was very open intellectually, and one had to study science. It was one of the new universities. Again, I'm in many ways a child of the the, the educational reforms of the 60s in Britain, in which not only did uh, working class children come into intellectual life in a way that was hadn't figured before, but also we came to, or many of us came to new kinds of institutions which were trying to break down the distinction between science and arts. Uh, there's a separate kind of history of that in Britain, which is very important. Um, and the university I went to was involved with, with that. There was Keele University, which I um, a very proud member, I was a very proud member, and because it opened me up to different kinds of influences. And my formation, therefore, was very different from a lot of historians in Britain, in that they were on a kind of conveyor belt which led from uh, their first school to their grammar school, perhaps, or to a private school for many of them, in which they would have been extremely specialised. Now, my formation was less specialised in, in this pedagogic, intellect, uh, academic, um, educational sense. And, Kiel. and then I went into the world of specialization. I went to Baylor, um, which had um, a link. Again, this is a kind of interesting sidelight in the British academic system, the way in which Oxford and Cambridge have a really extraordinary power, um, even in a place like Kiel, because Kiel was actually formed by a former master of Baylor, who was a social democrat, Lord Lindsay, who wanted to develop a new kind of more open, flexible education. So in a sense, the, the first institution I went to was a child of the, um, the second one, Balliol, uh, which has had this tradition. When I was there, it had a Marxist master, Christopher Hill, although I, we didn't see very much of him in those days. But um, I went into this intellectual environment um, of Oxford in which I became very aware already of, you know, of power. Um, of academic patronage, of connections. I was connected into various kinds of networks of particular supervisors who actually I didn't find particularly intellectually interesting and my supervisor was outside. So again, my, my kind of background is heterodox. It's not, I was very influenced and very brought up in that, that, uh, that ferment of the 70s, which, as I say, my generation of working class kids experienced um, for the first time, uh, we had a special kind of, you know, understanding of um, what was going on in terms of history from below, in terms of social history. My position, my experience, had given me a kind of um, scepticism about a lot of what I saw around me. Scepticism about Marxism, scepticism about populism. Um, because I saw, and was part of, I must say, uh, the history workshop of Raphael Samuel, who I, I prize greatly amongst the historians. I think he was uh, a wonderful example, an extraordinary person, and really one of the, one of the, one of the most, uh, how can I say, uh, one of the most important and uh, likable and influential 
people. Um, I, I I've lost the words a little bit because I was very fond of him. But you see, I was part of those things, but not part of them at the same time. Because I, I for good or ill, felt that I had a kind of inside knowledge that they didn't have. I mean, I had a knowledge of the class order within the working class. I went to school as a child through some of the worst slums um, in, never mind in Britain, but in, through, in Western Europe. Brendan Bean, who lived in that part of London, this is Ken and North Kensington, said it, you know, this street, Southern Street, which has a particular kind of importance in my formation. Um, he said it was a worst slum in Europe, and I think he wasn't far off it. Um, Southern Street has been the subject of a lot of uh, inquiry, actually. Uh, it's been the subject of wonderful um, book of uh, first street photographs by um, Richard Main. Um, I talk about a number of these, I, these aspects in uh, an article I've written actually called uh, More Secondary Modern Than Postmodern. Secondary Modern was the, school, the kind of school I went to, which was very um, low down the pecking order, the class order of British education. So people like in that kind of school did not do what I later came to do. So, um, uh, yes, indeed, I experienced that ferment. Uh, I was, unlike some people of that generation, I had, a, I wasn't, um, I was very importantly formed by people like E.P. Thompson and Hobsbawm, um, but in a kind of um, contrary wise way, as it were, you know. Yes, recognising the great merits and advances that they were, they were responsible for. Um, I think I gave one of my first papers at uh, Osborne's Social History Seminar in London mm -hmm. in the 70s, which was a very important uh, venue for the new kind of social history, in which Osborne would sit there and after the paper was over, um, spend half an hour expertly dissecting the paper, uh, praising it or damning it in great detail. So it was a very... Uh, a very um, difficult uh, baptism for the young historian. But, um, sorry, this is becoming a little bit too anecdotal, maybe. And no, uh, no. It, was a, it, was a, it was catching the, the, the ferment of the, the late 60s and the 70s, and then the dissolution of um, the dissolution of the left, as it were, in the late 70s, as I began my academic life. I think the, my academic life and uh, the political situation in Britain have always, um, there's always been a fairly close relationship between the two because I've been a kind of social historian and perhaps a country historian, but now a social historian again. But all the time I've also been a political historian. But politics, in, in this very wide sense of how power actually operates, how people come to consent and subordination, or seemingly, or resist in particular kinds of ways or simply don't, don't acknowledge at all what's going on around. There are many, many strategies uh, involved. So, um, so we, okay. We go, to, 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 the to, 80s, to, the, to the 80s. To the 80s, yeah. Although there's so much I haven't said about. The Thatcher yeah. <laughs> yeah. period, for example. Yeah. And uh, when your historical attention turns strongly to populism also and to mm. uh, a more cultural approach, I think, yeah. Uh, with this new book that is Visions of the People, 1991, that deepened uh, your interest in social imaginaries and uh, in uh, popular, popular inclusion within uh, uh, dominant structures of power. So here the problem of class is very important, so your approach, uh, even theoretical, uh, to the, the problem of class, I think in, in this moment uh, it was much clear, much uh, an, an important, a key problem for your uh, work. Uh, so you can speak, so you can tell yeah. us something about yeah. this. Well, I think the context for the visions of the people, which came out, it was a result of a long period of research and writing in the 80s, was indeed the, um, the success of. Uh, successive conservative governments, the gradual dissolution of what <coughs> um, was so much taken for granted for yeah. in the 1970s, um, the sense of a of a shared community, put it to put it very simply, um, my generation brought up in those in those in which the welfare state caught uh, caught hold, and it caught hold. Uh, very powerful ways. It gave us a set of social priorities and values, I think, 
which somehow seems to have been bred into us. I'm still not quite sure how that happened. But certainly, we were children of the welfare state, and to see that being unraveled, um, and to see it working through the kind of democratic processes, was something that I think demanded attention. Because clearly, Thatcherism wasn't just imposed from above, as it were. Um, conservatism, and this was happening in the States as well, was successful because it engaged the values, the mores of, of uh, British people and British working class people. So, interested in the actual nature of um, representations of the social order, uh, ways of, in which, um, well, broadly considered the working class, um, experienced the social around them and experienced a sense of social divisions. And I wanted to look at this very systematically and I wanted to take the, um, what were becoming already by then, the, you know, the advances of the cultural turn. I wanted to start thinking about these. But before then, um, my first book was called Work, Society and Politics. And already in that book, I was trying to push against the grain of the dominant argument, which was that the Industrial Revolution produced um, a a situation in which a class conscious pro proletariat developed the narrative of the making of the English working class, although Thompson was aware of the conservative aspects of the working class. Already in my first book, I'd been very much aware of culture, and the, the subtitle was The Culture of the Factory. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I was trying to understand social relations of subordination and domination in the factory districts um, in that first book. And that kind of um, interest was developing in a second book, which um, has not been mentioned, which was called The Historical Meanings of Work, which was a book of essays that I edited, which was a reflection, again, questions of meaning, uh, questions of representation. We had a look, I'd already in the first book looked at what we called in those days the labour process, um, something I'm coming back to in, in more recent work in terms of bureaucrats, in fact. Um, but um, in those first two works, I had already sort of plotted out some of the ground. So the meanings of work, um, the representations of work, the values of work, as, you know, I was in ways, in some ways, a labour historian, although basically still a social political historian, a kind of labour historian, because that's the kind of work that we so often did in those days. Because that was the new, that was, those were the elements that hadn't been looked at previously. This was the first time, and it was coterminous in British culture, with the way in which the working class, for instance, were represented in cinema for the first time in the 50s and 60s. But it was a rather similar thing that academics were beginning to do. And it was the, the Marxists, and in their different forms from the economistic, excuse me, Eric Osborne, economistic Marxism of Hobsbawm, to the populist, uh, very open-minded uh, Marxism, communism rather, because communism was in a way more important than Marxism um, in Britain. And then Marxism became more important uh, later on in its European forms. Um, at least those interested me much more. Uh, but, and I engaged with those in some of my later work with Gramsci, the way in which uh, Italian Eurocommunism, for instance, Gramsci were very influential in British Marxism. Um, and in social history. So, in the Visions of the People book, I just systematically attempted to look at a whole range of modes of representation and of areas of social life, in which one could um, ask the question, well, really, what is the shape of these representations of the social order that one sees? Are they like class? Or are, they, are, they, are, they, are they more uh, complex? Are they more open? Are they of a different order in terms of us and them, ordinary people against the powerful, um, the political classes in London against the people out there. So I, I set up a series of arguments um, about the different locations and trajectories of what I call populism. Um, and as I say, that was very much related to the fact that I seemed to be seeing around me in Britain at the time, and I think it's very much the case still. I think we have, we've come into a kind of much more market-based society as we've gone through the 70s and 80s. Uh, we've come into an era of mass communications, and I think we've also come into a new kind of, um, new forms of populism. Um, 
much more base to entertainment, celebrity, to information industries. Um, so, in many ways, I feel, it, looking back on, on that book, that uh, it made a, a, good, a considerable impact at the time, and I think it opened up the study of class. But I wish it had had more impact, in a way, because um, mm. I think it would have thrown light not only on the 70s and 80s, and on the 1870s and 80s, as well as the 1970s and 80s, but the, um, what's happening now. And it's a book I want to uh, revisit in some new work that I'm doing, because I think um, the question of populism is still uh, a very lively one, a very important one. But as I say, that was the period when, in that book, I began to sort of think about, uh, very systematically, what post-structuralism was about, beginning to think what Foucault was about, um, picking that up across the range of disciplines in which it impacted in Britain. It hit literary studies in a different way, a different time. History was always slower. It uh, affected sociology um, in, in important ways, I think. Um, and uh, especially, especially the work of Foucault. But in a subsequent book to The Room of Freedom, um, sorry, into The Visions of the People, Democratic Subjects, I, in a way, they were one book because the democratic subjects mm -hmm. was kind of the unfinished business of the first book, yeah. because I felt always that the first book but it's was theoretically... Well. It is different it's as well, different, yeah. 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 Um, I thought it was a completion of it, in a sense, because I hadn't really articulated the question of narrative yes. in Visions of the People, and I wanted to think about... Um, I wanted to think about class, I wanted to think about the social, um, and I was beginning to think about this whole category of the self. And the self, also. The self and the social, and how identity mm -hmm. was formed in, in a relationship between the self and the social. Mm -hmm. um, and the title itself was a play on the democratic, uh, and on the demotic as well, on populism and this notion of the people who are in the British context participants in the political process, they are subject, but they are also subjects in the sense that they are subjected. Um, and as you know, British, British citizens are not all citizens, they are called subjects of Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, so um, we have that play on words in terms of course the subject towards Foucault's work. And my, my sort of I think in the 90s it really was beginning to pick up with some work that the British sociologists um, had done. Not just sociologists, but people very much involved with Foucault at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, people like Nicholas Rose, um, Peter Miller, uh, people like Paul Rabinow in California, but less, not him at the time, but Rose and Rabinow were, they were part of that world which um, um, very much kind of responded to Foucault's presence. Uh, when, when Foucault was in California, Rabin was very much involved with him. I've just been working and teaching in Berkeley myself, so these things are somewhat on my mind. But it was certainly the, the very, I thought, very innovative and interesting work that was going on from the late 80s into the 90s, um, and has continued since in a variety of ways. Of course, history is always the last, as it were, the last to pick up on these things. Partly because, in large measure, because our work takes so long and we have to work through sources and we, uh, we don't produce the same kinds of work as, as, say, political sociologists or people who don't do empirical work. Um, so that was, um, again, I think all the books have led from one to the other, really. There's, a, there's an overall trajectory in terms of um, thinking about, about social relations class, about power, about politics, particularly power, I suppose, um, but a series of overriding kind of concerns through in different ways, but in conjunction with the political and theoretical um, happenings that were, were occurring around me at the time. Yeah. We can arrive to uh, the rule of freedom, uh, mm -hmm. the new book, uh, Liberalism and, and, and the City. Uh, and uh, the new di the, the, yeah, the direction of uh, uh, the new direction of this this year last year so the, the problem of politics and power 
uh, in this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you explain us the, this? Yeah. Um, right, well, I've already spoken uh, partly about um, the way in which I encountered the Foucauldian work um, of certain British sociologists, Nicholas Rose and others. Um, I think that really gave me a framework to think about power in a new kind of way, in the Foucauldian vein, but their work was also extremely empirical. Um, they were very interested in taking things apart and seeing how they worked. Um, interested in technologies of power, if you might say, you know, in the way in which the census worked, say, or cartography, or telegraphic systems. Um, and these people were beginning to interact, some of them, with um, some interesting uh, other intellectual trajectories which were um, partly to do with material process and material object. But um, uh, what was happening, I think, was mostly this kind of work opened my eyes to, um, in a sense, I could look at previous work in what for me at that time was really rather a, an importantly new way, and that was the way in which these people were looking at freedom. And for my earliest books, I suppose I've been, I've been looking at, I've been looking at power, and I've been looking at the way in which it was experienced, and wondering about how one could think about liberalism, really, as a political form. My first book was about popular conservatism, but it was, you know, related very closely to that. Yes. Was an interested in how interested in how liberalism worked, um, because very broadly, I mean, the kind of liberal inheritance in Britain and the neoliberalism we see today have been key elements in obviously in uh, political culture, and they were playing themselves out in all the kinds of historical contexts I, I was looking at, in terms of work, in terms of politics. Visions, in terms of the visions of the people and democratic subjects. So that had been an abiding concern, but I found a way of thinking about it which, through looking at power in this different way, not as something, a zero-sum understanding of power in which it was a kind of quantity, but looking at power in that way, that way in which power um, clustered, circulated, um, was present in everyday relations. Uh, this opened my eyes to thinking about freedom as a political technology, but thinking about it less as a goal or an aim in the usual kind of mainstream political philosophy, political history, um, which I was trying to get away from, but still I think those kinds of political questions are really important. Um, it, it made me aware that um, one could do a different kind of political history, and this is what I tried to do. And one could think about the political in a different way, um, in terms of the kind of governmental rationalities, the form, the many forms of governing conduct which were circulating in a society at a particular time. And I wanted to organise these in a particular way, and the way I found was to organise them in, in, the, in terms of the city. So um, the, the collection of different kinds of powers and rationalities that's, that were present in not just British society, because in the Rural Freedom Book, I tried to say something about other, other examples, particularly India, but some other European examples as well, and I drew in some US examples. Um, I was trying to explore uh, the, the kind of modalities, the, ration, the many rationalities in power, and organizing them around the city, um, and allowing the city, as it were, to tell the story of liberalism, of freedom. Um, and subsequent to that, um, again, it's a case of one book leading to the other. With the Rule of Freedom book, I was conscious that I was I had at the back of that book a kind of, um, as it were, an explanatory mechanism, which was the state. And uh, in the sense that uh, I was looking at the city as a kind of arena of, of these circulating powers and material technologies, trying to give them a kind of location in a narrative um, in some sense, trying to write a historical narrative, but recognizing when one adopted this particular understanding of power and of the political, it was rather difficult, and especially when one took on board 
materialities of power, which we know, that we knew then little about, we still know relatively little about, it's extraordinarily difficult to create a, a, a new sort of narrative, political narrative, um, looking at power in that way, because one is using kind of categories of taken from Foucault and so on, who, if we're not in the story, I mean, it's a story in one sense, um, and the people I was working with and continue to work with, like Nicholas Rowe, uh, at, at the LSE, where I'm now situated, um, were sociologists. They weren't historians, although they drew on history for me, in what for me was a very productive way. But they weren't at heart, obviously, sociologists, um, historians. And so it was, you know, there was um, what they were delivering and what, uh, you know, the kind of um, Foucauldian take on power opened the door to history, but it didn't enable you. It, did, it wasn't an historical method as such, as, as historians would understand. And that's, I still wanted to practice some sense of narrative. So I was aware in the state book, which I'm now doing, which is called The Soul of Leviathan, at least it's got two titles, but that's the one at the moment. <laughs> the new book is trying to really think systematically about the state, but using the armory of kind of Lucodian governmentality, but also thinking about some new areas which I've, um, I'm opening up, which I began to open up in the Rule of Freedom to do with questions of materiality um, and which are reflected in, in, in the new work that uh, I could say something more about. So perhaps we could go on to the, yes. the newer stuff. Yes, your, your uh, last essay that uh, will be published by uh, Past and Present very soon has a very expressive title, What is the Social in Social History? Uh, and try maybe to make the point about the state of the cultural turn and uh, today and to suggest new direction. And one of these new direction, one is the state, the, the new uh, attention to the state, and the other is the new attention to uh, a sort of uh, materiality and, uh, and what you called uh, a sort of material, material turn, if mm -hmm. possible. Uh, so if you can explain us better this, um, that yeah. is a new, a, a kind of new direction, but also a kind of uh, a sort of of, re, of come back to a, a, return, a, yeah. a sensibility for physical and environment yeah. and yeah. for for object that uh, yeah. I think it it's uh, it, it is yours from the beginning. <laughs> perhaps so. Perhaps so. <laughs> yes, I, I was always very interested in from the very earliest days. And say machines and how machines yeah. worked, or um, in the keeping of diaries, uh, in very much the, the, the fine grained detail of daily life. So that for me, Dustin yeah. Toe's yeah. work was always very interesting. And places also. Not and place, very, yeah. and place, from the very earliest times, yes. Place has been very important, um, perhaps, look, perhaps related to my own formation. Um, and I've always had a lot to do with geographers, and geographers have always responded to my work, and still do. So, geography plays, uh, for me, very important, yeah. Uh, the new work, um, the new work is reflected in the book on the state, uh, it's also reflected in another book that I'm, I'm, I'm involved with a, a centre, uh, a big centre at Manchester LU and partly at the LSE as well, called the Centre for Research in Sociocultural Change, um, C R E S C for stuff. You know, everything has initials these yeah. days. So <laughs> that's the initials that they have. Um, and they, um, this is a, a group of uh, many kinds of discipline, but chiefly yeah. social scientists. Relatively few historians, but I'm one of the historians involved. And I work with a, a man called uh, Tony Bennett, who's a British sociologist, who wrote a wonderful book about the museum some time ago, called The Birth of the Museum. Again, ahead of the game in many ways, taking up Foucault's work before, you know, at a time when not all that many people were. Anyway, the book that we're doing is called um, Material Powers. And as the, term, as the term indicates, we're interested in putting the new in interest in uh, materiality into relation with questions of power so that the essays on that partly concern the, concern the state and they partly concern colonial, um, colonial encounters or colonialism. Um, the new book on the state is trying to think out, um, trying to think out the state in the light of 
a whole series of intellectual changes that uh, have occurred in the last 20 years or so, in the social sciences particularly. The essay that uh, Carlotta refers to is um, What is the Social and Social History? And that's coming out soon, past and present. Um, and that's an attempt to do two things, to outline some of the areas that I think are, are fruitful and to try and exemplify rather briefly in a discussion of the state how, what difference these areas make for historical work in the sense of uh, how can we think about the state differently and what kind of questions and uh, what kind of uh, academic and um, empirical procedures can we, can we bring to bear. So that in terms of the first, I was trying to talk about developments, for instance, uh, coming out of the history of science and technology, about the production of knowledge itself, the place of materiality in the production of knowledge, the opening up to um, various kinds of anthropology which were asking questions about the way in which the human and the non-human nature and the social were actually coded differently in different cultures, in our cultures, Western European or Western cultures, are no different from other cultures. Uh, for me, the, um, the work with not only um, Bruno Latour, but Latour especially with actor network theory, was opening up some very interesting questions about agency, which I wanted to pursue, um, in which one had to bring in, I think, if one followed that, particular uh, debunking or critique of, of the idea of a reified totality, which is society. Um, Latour was giving that another twist. I mean, that had been going on for a long time, this movement away from the kind of traditional dualisms of structure and agency and nature and culture and so on and the social and, and the, the, the natural, and the social and the cultural as, as being sort of different things. That had been going on a long time, and I was earlier influenced by the work of Zygmunt Bauman, very much, um, who was writing about contemporary, the condition of contemporary society. And Bauman for me was quite important, actually, in, in many ways at the time, as important uh, as Foucault, um, because he was uh, opening up questions um, which whether one agreed with them or not, um, which were to do with the new kind of society that we seem to be entering into in the course of the 90s. Um, this is a somewhat meandering answer to your question, but I'm just trying to think in terms of the article itself as a way of codifying what I have to say. And the article, as I say, talks about some of these intellectual changes, talks about the area of what's become, come to be known as effect, in which questions of you know, biology, biology uh, questions of the precognitive uh, are involved, in which the, the, the emphasis is taken away from the human subject again, and, and to sort of the precognitive, as it were, and to the world of emotions, and the world in which these are calibrated and machined by uh, particular kinds of technologies, especially in the present. Now that work came together with, for me, um, a lot of work that was coming out of historical sociology. I was very influenced by, by, by people who I didn't think doing wonderful work. Uh, people in the University of California system, like uh, Chandra Mukherjee and Richard Bionacki, historians of, lab of, of the garden and of state power and of labor in the case of Bionacki. Mm -hmm. And I worked in the University of California, San Diego for some time, where actually Latour had also operated, and before him, um, Michel de Soto had visited. So, and uh, Stephen Shapin, who was involved in that wonderfully, uh, wonderful book, um, Leviathan and the Airplan, was one of the co-authors of that, which Latour actually lent on very heavily for his understanding of what he called the modern constitution, the, the separation of, uh, of the real and representation, uh, however one wants to think about it. Um, so, um, I, for me, um, these, these influences came together, and I wanted to put them together with the governmentality uh, question, and as I say, in, relate, in bringing the question of power very much into this. So that is coming forward in this new book on the state, which has taken a long time to write, but which bits of it are, are, are published. I published, um, there's, a, there's an article on the file and filing systems as one example of the materialities of power, which is coming out in the book, Material Powers. And there's other stuff on the post office, which is uh, available on the web. Um, but I'm turning my attention now to uh, a, a much more systematic work um, on freedom itself, when I eventually, I hope very soon, get the, the state book out.
and um, perhaps a little early to say more about that, but uh, I can do if, if you want. It's, it's very much about post-1945 and wanting to bring my work into the 20th century and then very systematically ask questions about, well, what, you know, what are the different approaches to freedom and how can we think about uh, a new kind of political, social, cultural history, call it what you will, these labels don't mean that much to me, but I suppose I'd still call myself a social historian after all this. Okay. <laughs> Listen, I forgot to uh, to ask you something about the uh, chronological aspect of your work. I mean, you always I think uh, your work uh, was concentrated on uh, 19th century. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, why? Which is the sense of this? Or uh, do you think to move to to <laughs> 20th century or not? <laughs> well, the why of, why of the 19th century is partly uh, partly the sort of accident, as it were, of one's own academic career. In that, when I came into historical writing, the the key areas were the the 19th century was a key area. Um, it was where Hobsbawm and Thompson were writing about class. Uh, it was, um, especially in Britain, now it for, say, in Anal, the Anal, Anal influence for me was important actually, and then in, t in t talking about materiality, I, th I would, in this article I'm doing, or I have just done, um, uh, Braudel was an important figure. So for me, also this kind of aspiration to his Gla Total, um, that, was a, that was quite important. And there were many other influences which I haven't talked about actually, the earlier. Uh, British sociology was producing some very interesting work on cultures of work itself at the time. I don't have time to go into that, but the influences that are, were at work upon one are, are very varied, and as I said at the start, this is a highly selective account. So I've left out various other things that I know would take, it would need explanation, but take too long to explain. So there's another kind of, there's another story behind this story, which, uh, which I could write, and then there's another story behind that, which somebody else would have. Right, because I don't know. Yeah. But um, uh, one landed in the 19th century because that's where the action was, really. And I got all historians tend to sort of concentrate in particular periods. Um, and that's the, the, the kind of empirical ground you get to know and feel comfortable with. Mm -hmm. And in a curious kind of way, you're interested in. Uh, and quite often the interest stops at a particular kind of time. But um, in the state book, um, I've very much kind of gone from aspects from the 18th century into the 20th century. So I've already sort of gone back earlier and gone, and gone later. But the, um, you know, there, there comes a time when one needs to sort of move on, I suppose. And uh, I want to, in this new book on freedom, which will be located in the two cities I've known best, London and Manchester, as an empirical basis, or will there be lots of other sorts of avenues, if I ever get to write it, that is, other sorts of um, ways that I want to look at it, things like pedagogy and things like representations of freedom, populist representations in newspapers and so on, <coughs> you know, systematically post-1945, picking up on the kind of welfare state ideology and way which it, it fell apart after that. Not completely apart, there's still, still a kind of resource that we have that, that we draw on, and I think it's an important resource. But um, it was a particular <laughs> location and a sense of my, I wanted to entwine my own biography and you know, mm -hmm. distress that myself. So, you know. Listen, we can finish with uh, uh, a question about uh, the cultural term and postmodernism. And, um, about the entropy that uh, we often saw around uh, the, the risk of the uh, relativism in history that postmodern thought uh, can uh, involve, uh, and, uh, and the need that, uh, that we see in many books and many reactions, historical reactions, to strongly def defend history from that risk. So, which is your position? Well, I. I think that the risk was um, pretty much non-existent um, and there was a kind of hysteria about it at the time. When I gave, I gave you a paper yesterday and I talked a little bit about this uh, and um, I still feel it quite strongly that in the 1990s 
we could have taken much more productive uh, avenues, we could have moved forward in a much more productive way if we'd engaged seriously, theoretically. Um, and I talked about how, or you referred in passing to how many um, historians are theoretically illiterate, um, which is a rather harsh way of putting it perhaps, but I think <laughs> on balance, I, I, I think that illiteracy has really raised many kinds of problems, and those were evident in the 90s. Um, and it's difficult to know quite. I mean, I think I'd have to think about it more systematically uh, through the course of the 90s. American historians, British historians, of course, one could understand it in terms of sort of Marxists um, and some left inclined historians who felt that uh, the shifting away from class and shifting away from economic explanations, evident in the culture, threatened them directly. But I suppose other people felt threatened because of rel relativism also, the left felt. But for me, relativism, relativism is, isn't the, the problem. Relativism is the solution. Um, and one, you know, we need to start from that ground and defend the particular kind of knowledge that uh, we practice as historians, the particular kind of protocols we have, um, to do with the archive, to do with the way in which we, we validate our work, produce our work as an historical community, as a pedagogic community, and as a, a wider kind of social and political Community, the way in which we, we elaborate our notions of truth, validity, and so on, in terms of um, in terms of these particular these different arenas um, of intellectual and social life, or political life. So, um, as I say, uh, I tried to give some explanation in the nineties, um, but it still puzzles me to some extent uh, of why the resistance, and I can perhaps understand it uh, in terms of, uh, would be rather uh, critical of the historical profession. I mean, certain closed minds that were rather closed, uh, theoretical illiteracy, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know, sorts of overreaction, um, which produced a kind of genre of books at the time, which were defences of history, which no doubt sold quite well and didn't do the careers of the people involved any harm. But that is being uh, a little bit cynical, perhaps, so I'd better not go down that road. <laughs> Once you could recur about the sense of history, no, no. Uh, when recur said, said uh, history is a vocation, an ethical matter of obligation to real people in the past. Uh, this yeah. is your position also? What is it? Yes, um, I felt that um, always that there is a, a sort of ethics and politics involved with what I've been doing and I've always been very aware of the way in which okay taking up Foucault's work uh, knowledge is related to power um, that academic life is inseparable academic life is inseparable from um, political questions I wrote an article in past and present over 10 years ago called the politics of academic history in Britain uh, so, uh, first, the, the title itself, that was a subtitle, the title was um, The Return of History, in which I was trying to f uh, signal in some way that, uh, um, that history really had been there all, all the time. It hadn't been endangered and uh, we didn't really need to worry too much. But what we needed to do is explain this, uh, this concern with postmodernism. Actually, as I think back now, um, I did in that article, uh, Try to recollect these things now. Um, one gets a bit forgetful. I did try and give some account of the way in which, in, in the sense in which, in Britain, uh, for historical reasons, uh, the reception of postmodernism had taken the, the particular direction it had. Uh, Let me just say a couple of things, perhaps, about the ethical aspects yes. of, of, of historical work. Um, for me, from the very beginning, historical work has been a kind of politics, I suppose. Coming out of the, the 60s and social history, it was always very connected to theoretical questions and aware of the political nature of the discipline. Um, 
And its interest in theoretical questions was related to the political environment around it. It was interested in, uh, it was interested in class, it was interested in the nature of work and what, what, how that was experienced. It was interested, beginning to be interested in questions of gender. Um, so it was a kind of political inheritance, but as and the and neoliberalism began to be, I use that term loosely, began to tighten its grip or to you know, extend the realm of what we regard as a long history of, of, liberal, of liberalism, because the relationship between neoliberalism, so-called, and liberalism is a very complex one, which I need to, I think that we all need to unravel much more. Um, as that happened, the, um, as it were, the kind of political identity of those of us who were broadly on, on the left was forced inward, as it were. So um, what was an academic activity that was much more directly related to, politi to politics became somewhat less directed as the left, decre as the left decreased in, in power and became less, became less significant. Um, it became to be, and apparently there was this, there was, well, not just partly, but very importantly, there was a turn towards what might loosely be called identity politics. So that the, um, the politics of, I thought, to my mind, the politics of an historian began to be something that I could think about and elaborate a little bit more distinctly than some of my colleagues. So in the earlier days, in the 60s and 70s, there was a more direct opening to politics, and I think in line with identity politics, in a, an article I wrote called um, The Gift of the Past, I think, um, I was partly trying to think about that, trying to think about the way in which, drawing on Foucault's work, one could think about um, history, historical work, think about it in the political dimension, but think about it as a vocation. Um, uh, thinking, think about it in terms that were akin to a style of life, an ethical kind of self stylization which was, which was also political. Um, and I drew on Ricoeur's work as well in, in, in trying to think that, to, to go back to what my original feelings were. And in this article, The Gift of the Past, I talked about my Irish background and about the sense of the past or of an Irish past. <coughs> and of the way in which power had operated in that context, and in the context of immigrants um, who had come to England, and the way in which they were the powerless, and the way in which still I had that sense coming from the 60s that I wanted to talk about those hidden from history, a term which was used about women, but I, I kind of talk about gender in a more recent work. Um, but for me, I was looking at the poor very broadly, um, but it became, I, my subsequent work has been about the rich and the powerful, that's the other side of the coin, the, the two are inseparable, and the problem with a lot of the social history in the early days, when it was concerned with history from below, it should have been concerned with history from below and above, and about the relationships between the two. My first book was about the employers as well as those below. Anyway, sorry, that's a, that's a digression that you could edit back into an earlier yeah. section if you want to. But, um, it's also become apparent to me that there's limits to this idea of just the historian as, as, um, as uh, a kind of form of ethical practice, ethical being. I think that's important. But I'd also want to think about the history I do anyway as reconnecting back with the, much more directly with the kind of political processes that are going on now. So that, in thinking about the social and rethinking the social, kind of work I've done in this article, on the, the recent article on um, what is the social, and I've tried to exemplify in the state book. It's trying to really talk about the, the nature of political institutions in a much more direct kind of way, to connect to the way in which an understanding of the past of the state can relate to the present, and vice versa, the way in which we as historians kind of, as it were, write the history of the present, but we also write the history of the past. We're different from social scientists. The Foucauldians I was involved with had an interesting network, for instance, called History of the Present, and I think that's the term that comes from Foucault. So we do the history of the present, but we also do the history of the past, and that's the, that's the kind of agonistic um, relation that we are, we're always in, this, this 
relation between past and present. I say agonistic because it's uh, always fractured and difficult and we don't. And it's something that one agonizes over, and it's something that one has to think about in terms of the nature of time itself. Um, but um, I suppose what's shaping my comments now is the sense that we seem to be moving after the, um, the, the, the failures of the world economy and of world capitalism in the kind of context of ecological change, the kind of world that we seem to be producing, we, may be, we seem to be moving out of this old political dispensation of identity politics. Maybe it's unclear. Um, and I, as I said before, I think, uh, I'm using identity politics in a rather loose term. Maybe it only describes certain of the political currents that have been there. So if we do move out of this um, environment, we need to know much more than we do, I think, about the nature of the social, about material life at a time when, for instance, nature and, and culture are combined in new kinds of ways, new kinds of fusion in bioengineering, that we have a kind of, we intervene in life itself, we have the politics of life that now to consider. So that all the old categories between the human and the material, the human and the non-human, are actually dissolving in front of our eyes, and questions of identity are of course being raised as a consequence, so there is a new interest in identity, I suppose. But uh, I think we need to turn our attention to back to the kinds of um, concern that were present earlier and didn't last now. The state, the economy, the nature of capitalism itself in a much more systematic way. And cultural history has by and large not engaged with those areas, with some exceptions. But this is the, um, the direction I would like to think that uh, my new work would be moving on this new work on freedom that I talk about post-1945 and the work on the state. So there is a double sense of the politics of the historian in terms of a kind of ethical dimension, a kind of ethical working on the self, as it were, um, the sense of the vocation. And I think academic life, the book that I'm writing on the state is about two areas of vocation which feed into the modern state. And one is the academic itself and the other is the bureaucrat because I think these are two key figures of the modern world, of the modern state, and it's essential to understand them. So understanding ourselves as academics is, I think, central to understanding the way in which the modern state is developed, because Marx called the bureaucrat the high priest of the state, and I think of the academic as, in a sense, the high priest of civil society, the high priest of, of the public sphere, or the, the social outside the state. So, I think.